Good morning. Let's, let's all stand for a prayer. Please fold your hands and pray with me. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, friend, friend, beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Bhagavan Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O beloved God, in the sanctuary of my soul, I will weave a garland of devotion with the longings of my heart. I will offer it with reverence at thy feet of omnipresence. Om, peace, amen. Please be seated. We are gathering peace in our hearts and we are sending love and healing peace. All are God's children. And now with your eyes closed and the gaze lifted toward heaven, draw a slow, gentle, inhaling breath. Exhale and relax your body. Let the mind and the emotions remain quiet. and feel stillness within you. Guruji says that stillness and calmness of heart and mind is the altar of God. Now feel within you, flowing from the stillness within, a vibration of soothing peace. It fills your body, it fills your heart. 
It consumes your whole being. This tangible vibration of peace felt in meditation is the presence of God within you. Concentrate on this peace and it will begin to expand. Feel it growing with intensity and strength. Let us send our love out as we chant home together over and over again. Thank you. That's the power of true hearts getting together. I think my first message is, do not let this painful human drama interrupt the integrity of your personal spiritual life. There's a tendency to become naturally, compassionately involved. And the world needs our prayers right now, needs our support in many different ways. But we must not suspend our inner spiritual practice because this is what keeps us strong. This is what gives us gifts to give. At times like this, our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda would deepen his spiritual practice. He would intensify his effort. And that's what the world needs right now. So don't allow yourself to become 
mentally and emotionally distracted, remain focused. Your spiritual inner work is your primary work. It's what makes you part of the solution and not part of the problem. So this morning, we're concentrating on our inner relationship with God and how we can make it more dynamic. We all have an inner connection, and this is what we're talking about, the strength and power of our inner connection. How can we make the experience of this inner connection more tangible, more real? God is present and omnipresent and yet invisible. And Paramahansa Yogananda says the way to connect with this invisible omnipresence is through our inner communion. And so we want to talk a little bit today how we can do this and how we can make our relationship more dynamic. Well, God has created relationships. God has manifested this world and is the author and designer behind the exchanges that take place between us as human beings and has created the sense of value that we have for each other. So a question that we can ask is, what dynamics do we enjoy in our relationships with each other? What makes for satisfying human relationships? I think we would all say trust. Being able to trust each other, trust our words, our actions, our motives, um, respect. We respect others and we want them to respect us and the way they behave with us shows their respect. And so I think mutual respect is important. Acceptance. When we go through changes, we want others to be able to accept our changes. When we're strong, when we're weak, when we're you know, going forward in a new way, we want others whom we trust to be able to say, I, I trust you. I, I know that you're doing what you feel is best for you, and I support that. So a sense of acceptance and understanding. And I think another dynamic is mutual caring. That is to really know that another person really cares for you and that you can share and disclose and they will remain confidential and private and they will do whatever they can to support you. So I think these things we value in human relationships. And I think a last element is open-hearted two-way communication. Being able to talk with someone openly and have them respond to us and know that if something changes in their hearts that involves us, they will talk to us, they will tell us. So there is this kind of constant open-hearted communication and it's two ways. I think we would all agree that These qualities make our human relationships fulfilling. Now, the inner relationship with God actually is the same because a relationship with God is like a graduate relationship. We're stepping up to a whole new level. And we need to discover what ways God speaks to us so that we might listen and ways that we might relate to God so that we might commune. But you are here now, today, because even though God is invisible and intangible, you have experienced something that was very powerful. It was invisible, but it was very real. And you said, oh, you know, there is an invisible force, an invisible intelligence, a universal love that can impact me and my life. So you're here because perhaps there was a prayer that was answered miraculously and you couldn't deny it. There was some kind of intervention going on. You had prayed and then something shifted and you really felt it. It was like there was something there that was 
working for you. Or maybe a mystical feeling of comfort. I know a lot of people feel this when they're afraid and they don't know where to turn. They feel helpless in the face of conditions. And then there comes this soothing feeling of comfort that removes the fear. There can also be an intuitive insight. So you're struggling to try to grasp something or capture something or solve a problem. And all of a sudden an insight comes and you think, oh, those aren't my thoughts. That wasn't my thought. It has come from another source that, you know, is bringing the solution. I was talking this last week with a young woman in Alberta, Canada, and she told me, she said, brother, I used to feel empty and lonely, but since I have committed myself to daily meditation practice, a shift has taken place. There is a mysterious fullness of heart. It's always with me now. Is this God? And of course I replied, yes. It's invisible. It's in many ways very subtle, but it's huge in its impact. There's no more insecurity. There's only this fullness of heart and mind, this reassurance, the soothing reassurance that everything is okay. So God speaks to us in the language of the heart. And this is the way that God starts a relationship with you and I. We have these mystical signals that there's something else touching our hearts and minds. There's a definite presence and it feels sacred. It may happen only now and then again, but yet it's proof that God does exist and God is with us. I was leading retreats, retreat programs in Europe, and early one morning I was out walking in the Swiss countryside, uh, and I was on a pathway through uh, an alpine meadow. It was a beautiful morning, and there were cows out grazing. I, you know, the, the bells were clanking. And I stopped to look at the mountains and the meadow and the yellow buttercup flowers. And I was just kind of standing there enjoying the scenery. And one of the Swiss brown cows caught my attention. And she was curious and she kind of walked over with her bell clanking. And she walked right up to me. She was chewing on grass and a few flowers hanging out of her mouth. And she just came up really close and she kind of sniffed me. I didn't pet her, I thought maybe I would, but I just looked at her and she just looked at me. And we were just looking at each other. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I saw God in her eyes. There was a cosmic intelligence that was flowing through her eyes and was looking at me. And all of a sudden I was looking at God and God was looking at me. And I just stood there you know, with, am with amazement. And she was chewing on the flowers <laughs> and just staring at me, almost not blinking. And then she got bored and walked away. But I took something special with me. God was watching me and I was watching God. Sometimes there's that experience where you are outside and you are looking up at the stars. And it's one thing to gaze at the stars. But have you ever had the experience of the stars gazing back at you? This is what God is in divine omnipresence. There's a cosmic intelligence that's everywhere. And God is expressing through it. The Bhagavad Gita describes this perfectly. Krishna says in chapter 6, verse 30, he who perceives me everywhere and beholds everything in me never loses sight of me, nor do I ever lose sight of him. And Paramahansa Yogananda comments on this. He says, to the ordinary person, God seems to be absent or vanished from the universe. But the yogi sees the ever watching eye of God gazing at him through all windows of space. 
The face of his cosmic beloved is omnipresent. And our late president, Sri Dayamata, uh, used the same verse once in an inspirational talk. He who watches me always, him do I watch. He never loses sight of me, nor do I ever lose sight of him. And then Dayamata said, I pray that from this time on, you will silently watch that beloved one. He remembers as always, it is we who are forgetful. So whether God is he or she, or God is universal cosmic intelligence, which tends to be my ishta. In India, there is the ishta or the, the God identification, the one that you can relate to. For me, it's like a universal cosmic intelligence, and I'm perfectly intimate with that concept. So no matter what concept of God is familiar and comfortable for you, God has created us all, and God has created us and loves us equally. He who watches me always, him do I watch. He never loses sight of me, nor do I ever lose sight of him. Now, is God playing favorites? That is, I only watch the ones who watch me, <laughs> or I only care about those who watch me. But the answer really here, I think, is that God offers silent, invisible love and watchfulness for all souls. And this verse is really inviting you into an interactive relationship. And this is one of the dynamics of a successful relationship. It's interactive. It's mutual. And so God is saying, you know, step into an interactive relationship with me. We will watch and commune with each other. A little modern parable. Let's say you have two little girls. Maybe they're twins. They look alike, but they're very different. So one little girl is very self-absorbed. She is very self-contained and she's in a little fantasy world a lot of times. When she plays games, she's playing by herself or she has a, you know, like a fantasy friend. Um, and she's just quietly playing. When she reads, she kind of reads to herself. Um, and she just kind of, you know, is in her own little world. She's so sweet. She's very thoughtful. She's shy. But she's kind of solitary. The other one, the other girl, is very different. She's always seeking your attention. She wants to know what you think. She's asking you questions. And when she plays games, she wants you to play with her. When she reads a book, she wants you to read to her or she wants to read to you. Now, you love both little girls more than life itself, but is one special? Maybe it's the one who wants to interact with you. I think this tells us something. We love both children equally, and yet there's something special about one who wants connection. We can't help but respond to that desire for connection. But the story continues. So let's say the shy, solitary little girl gets older and she goes to college and you're all worried about her because you're not sure how she's going to do. She kind of wanders away to a university and you're worried about her. You don't know if she's going to be able to make it in the world and how she's going to be able to, you know, find herself there. Well, something happens. You don't know what it is, but something devastates her. And she comes rushing back home. She wants to be in her room. And now she wants attention. She wants to be hugged. She wants to be held. She wants to share. She wants to talk. All of a sudden, everything starts to open up inside her heart. And how do you feel? My little girl is back. You know? You can feel it. The connection is there. The desire to connect. She's reaching out. Something is more complete. Now, this is expressed by Jesus in an ancient parable. And if you grew up in Western Christian churches, you know very well the parable of the prodigal son. So Jesus is 
making up this parable for his disciples uh, to form a teaching. And he essentially says that there is a wealthy man and he has two sons. And one son is a you know, loyal, communicative son. And the other one is kind of a renegade and solitary guy. He goes on his own way. And one day as a teenager, he says to his dad, uh, I would like my inheritance early because I want to get out in the world and do some stuff. And the father says, uh, you really don't know enough about the world, son. I think it'd be better if you waited. He said, no, dad, I've made up my mind. I just want to get out and have a good time. And I'd like to have my inheritance now. So the father is a good father and he gives him his cash. And the boy goes out. And sure enough, according to Jesus' story, he blows the wad. You know, he just, he doesn't have any discrimination and he gets fleeced like the sheep. And he finds himself in a destitute situation and he realizes, I really screwed up. I would have a much better life if I was living with my father at home. I've lost all my money. I don't have any hope for the future. And so he eats humble pie and he goes back to his dad. And he's thinking as he's going back to his father, he's thinking, well, maybe my dad will let me you know, live in the servants' quarters and maybe I can, you know, clean out the stables or something. He's thinking he doesn't really deserve to be a true son. But the story, according to Jesus, is the father sees his son coming from a distance and he runs to greet him. And he hugs him and he holds him and then he throws a big party. You know, my son is back. Now the son that remained is jealous and he gets angry and he says, you never threw a party for me. And the father says from the scripture, Luke 14, son, he says to the, to the son who remained, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and now is found. And so our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda builds on this, this parable to illustrate the fact that God is always waiting for us to reach out and make connection. And as soon as we do, with heartfelt sincerity, then God is ready to reach back. So God wants this interactive relationship. He who watches me always, him do I watch. Guruji says in commentary on this passage, no matter how long a dreamer in dreamland deems himself a wicked man, on waking, he becomes free from that identity. Every being came from God, and even in the forgetful dream of mortality, everyone remains a potential sleeping God. Forsaking his lifelong obsessive imaginings of being a hopeless renegade, Man should awaken himself in God. So men, there's a message here for you. You guys who are spiritual outlaws, <laughs> are you a hopeless renegade? God wants you. God wants us all. And so we want, God wants a relationship with each one of us. And God has introduced that relationship in very mystical ways. And you're here because you have felt that. And God even has uniquely, in some ways, defined the kind of relationship that he wants with you, according to the experiences that you have had. And God wants an interactive relationship. So there needs to be some kind of inner communion and interactivity where we are both giving and sharing and receiving. But this is something that requires us to develop. We need to develop. So what does God want from us? He wants the same thing that we want from each other. The same qualities. The same qualities that makes a human relationship dynamic, makes an inner relationship with God dynamic. As human, so divine. The way you love virtuously is the way that God loves you. 
And this we might call the law of repeating patterns. Paramahansaji very sweetly defines in his teachings how throughout different levels of creation, uh, the same patterns repeat themselves. And so what you desire from others, what you desire most from others is what God desires most from you. This is the divine law of repeating pattern. And so it's not like it's something we don't know or are not familiar with. It's something that we already know, we can feel. If you've ever had your heart broken by you know, treachery, take a look at the dynamics there and you'll see that something very sacred was violated and you felt it instinctively. And so this is the way that we can begin to define uh, the relationship, the dynamic relationship that we have with God. So in daily life, in daily life, uh, we can begin to develop a reciprocating relationship, one that has two-way dynamics. You can start very easily by directing your mental conversation toward God. You're talking to yourself, I know it. <laughs> now, I don't know what you're saying to yourself, but I know you're talking to yourself. And when you talk to yourself, you make an assumption. I'm alone. You are not alone. God is part of you and is witnessing that solitary conversation. So if you can make a new assumption that when I am talking to myself, I am not alone. God is there with me waiting to take part in that inner conversation. Isn't this cool? It's very organic. We do it all day long, every day. Try it this coming week. You find yourself complaining. You think you're complaining to yourself. God is there. God is listening. God is not judging. When, as soon as we start to include God in the conversation, the conversation improves. This is another subtle law. If you are tired of the same old, same old inside the head, start sharing it with God. You don't have to deny anything. You don't have to be ashamed of anything. Just start sharing it. It becomes purified just by the act of sharing. And pretty soon you find your mind is not so prone toward idle chatter. You often say, oh gosh, why am I wasting time with these kinds of thoughts? It doesn't happen so much anymore because you are sharing that conversation with God. So I have learned to become very intentional in my inner conversation because if we want quality intimacy, we have to have quality conversation. And this is how we can start developing it with God. And so I will say very simply, Lord, I need direction. And yesterday I was thinking about Lake Shrine and how we are going to step up our operations going forward. And the first thing I did was say, Lord, guide me, direct me. Now I made the request. I didn't then run away. I also didn't start rambling with my thoughts. I remained quiet time to listen. What does God have to say? At first there's stillness and then thoughts quietly start to come. I'm not initiating them. They're starting to manifest in my consciousness and it's just one good thought after another. And it started, like I said at the beginning, with take it slowly. But then it started to grow from there and take this and then that and he was putting things in order for me, things that I knew needed to be done, but I wasn't sure about the order. And by the time 30 minutes had passed, there was a kind of a conceptual wholeness there. Not only a wholeness as to what I needed to do, but what God wanted done. This was very simple, but this is something that I do 
all the time. There is a sharing. I tend to keep the sharing simple. And then there is a receiving. In solving problems, I like to have what I call an elegant solution. A uh, definition for me for an elegant solution is, is one that addresses all aspects of the problem with an elegant simplicity. I love to come up with an elegant solution because they always work. And so if I'm faced with a complicated problem and I'm having difficulty even wrapping my mind around it, I just stop. I let myself be quiet and I say, Lord, I need an elegant solution. <laughs> And I remain quiet. I don't push, I just keep concentrating, waiting, waiting. He who watches me always, him do I watch. I'm feeling that God is there with me. And then thoughts start to come. Now I don't hear, you know, angelic voices or golden letters being written. I get these quiet thoughts, but I know they have God's signature behind them. And whenever I'm getting those thoughts and I put them into practice, they always work out. So I gain a confidence in being able to receive consultation from within. In this way, we also feel God as a partner. We feel like we're partnering with God and God is collaborating. So creating a more dynamic relationship within means inviting God into collaboration. The little girl who wants to play alone or play with the parent. You know, invite God into the game and you will see that you win more often. That's the result. And what applies in daily life also applies in meditation. And so you're out at night and you're looking at the stars, you look up into the darkness and you're gazing at the stars and then suddenly the stars are gazing back at you. When we sit in meditation, we sit quietly, we close the eyes, we lift the gaze, centering at the point between the eyebrows. And at first you may behold only darkness, but there's more there especially if you practice techniques given by Yogananda to quiet the heart, to quiet the mind, to put us into a state of divine receptivity. At first you're gazing into darkness and it seems like there's nothing there. That's because we're used to communicating through the senses and perceiving through the senses. But if you quiet the thoughts and you quiet the emotions, there can become a light that shines in the darkness and suddenly this space within you comes alive. It comes alive. And you feel that you are in the presence of something that is there with you and it feels sacred. This is the language of God. This is the way that God reveals himself, herself to us. And we can actually just sit quietly in this living stillness. And we can feel it beginning to grow because as we concentrate on it, it gains strength. It gains strength and it begins to expand and it becomes more and more real and more and more tangible. We think it might take a long, long time, but actually once we start connecting and we concentrate on the little connection that's manifesting, it begins to grow rather quickly. And we realize that the connection that we have within is becoming stronger and stronger. And this is a perfect uh, description of communion. And this is what communion is. The definition of communion, a deep, interactive, intimate connection. You can look it up. That's the definition. Communion, a deep, interactive, intimate connection. Isn't this what we want with each other? This is what we want. We work really hard for it. <laughs> we get so little. We want deep, interactive, intimate connection. And this is what God wants with us. And this is communion. 
deep, interactive, intimate connection. And this comes most powerfully in the stillness of meditation, but we can also experience it in daily life. It can manifest at any time. Down in the meditation garden, in the rose garden, you can check it out. Uh, There's intense competition among the roses now (laughs) to see who can bloom first. I think one of them has already won. It was looking like it was going to open yesterday. So go check it out. They're competing very heavily right now (laughs) to see who will win the first bloom prize. And so when you look at the rose, let the rose look back at you. And that's God. Guruji says, in devotional interiorization, the meditator experiences true communion with God in the actual perception of his presence as light, wisdom, love, and bliss. And so God can begin manifesting to you in many different ways. Uh, The way that you will know it is because it feels sacred. Whatever is taking place, there's a sacredness to it. And if you honor that sacredness and you concentrate upon it, it will begin to grow. So with a silent openness of heart, feel in the stillness that God is with you. Feel that you are sharing yourself. You can just share yourself. You don't have to describe all your problems. The mind has already hashed that out and God's been listening. So God knows all about it. Just share yourself and then receive. And this is very important because remember, a dynamic relationship is interactive. It's reciprocal. So you share and then receive. And then share again and receive. You can deepen your connection this way. And this is how communion develops as you share and receive. And pretty soon you realize that your relationship with God is becoming more dynamic. He already speaks your language, but he wants you to learn a higher verse. And here we are getting instruction in the graduate relationship of being with God. We are learning to commune on a higher level. And it's much to our advantage because there's great happiness here. There's great reassurance and comfort, even through terrifying times. And this is what the great masters of all religions have experienced. And this is why our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda could live a life that spanned two world wars and the greatest economic depression the world has ever known. Endless revolutions and a number of devastating pandemics. And you read his words and you think, how is this possible? The man's so full of inspiration. Going through dark times and gaining inspiration of God within is it's a powerful accomplishment. So don't miss out. We'll be getting group meditation soon and we can practice this together. So try this coming week to deepen your dynamic inner relationship with God, sharing and receiving, sharing and receiving. I can only give you suggestions because this is deeply personal. You will do it in your own way and that's the way God wants it. There's not a book we can read or a lecture we can hear that will tell us how to do it. We need to just start engaging. It starts with that desire to connect. And then we go from there, we build from there. Guruji says, when the mind is calm, it becomes a divine altar for the presence of God. So we have that potential altar right within us. It's just a matter of entering in, entering in. I hope this is helpful. With everything that goes on, we get distracted and we become involved and it's right that we should, but don't sacrifice your inner life. Don't sacrifice it. Put more strength, invest in it. And you will see that um, inspiration can flow without reservation at all times. 
and that you are strong and that you can give and contribute better um, to the world drama. This is a role that God wants each one of us to play. Let us have a moment of meditation together and a closing prayer. Let us ask God now to give a blessing of compassion for all those families whose lives are being destroyed by war. Please fold your hands and pray with me. Beloved God, Amen. beloved Guru, beloved in the sanctuary of my soul, the of soul. I, will I will weave a garland of devotion with my eternal gratitude, my eternal gratitude. and I will offer it with reverence, offer it with reverence. at thy feet of omnipresence. Oh, peace. peace. Amen. Amen.